Hello friends! In the last video we had a really interesting discussion about why we don't need government and the answer was fairly clear-cut. The fact that governments are coercive agents. They're institutions designed to control humanity rather than to protect it. More importantly, at least to me, is the idea that governments don't bear any resemblance to humanity. It doesn't contain our emotional essence, right? Governments are bureaucracies that are based on political expediency. In this video, I want to uncover the origin story of government, where it came from, how it evolved, and why it ended up the way that it did, especially in modernity, as we have to deal with these large gargantuan nation states that subdue and subjugate large populations. So a really interesting book I recommend everyone read in anticipation of this video, or as a result of this video rather, is called Against the Grain, A Deep History of the Earliest States by James C. Scott. Now as, a, as an aside, James C. Scott is a well established and extremely appreciated historian. He was, he, he has been highly cited by many historians and is well respected. In his book he makes the case against what he calls the standardized civilizational model or the standard civilizational model or narrative of human governments within society. And according to this model or this narrative, and a lot of scholars have suggested this, is the idea that governments were a necessary innovation in human social organization. In other words, governments came about because we needed to establish rules and set up laws and mandates to prevent bad people from running amok. James the whole thesis behind James C. Scott's work is the idea that this is false, this narrative is false, and the reality is that, that governments emerged as a result of the agricultural revolution and the fact that us humans, after the agricultural revolution, we became more sedentary. And because we became more sedentary, this created an, an environment where we made ourselves more vulnerable, more susceptible to theft, to extortion, to expropriation, and to, to harm. Prior to the agricultural revolution, according to James C. Scott, we were more nomadic. We were a hunting and gathering species. Our groups, our groups, our tribes were more localized and we were always a different place. We never stayed in the same location. So in this nomadic environment, this nomadic environment was not the necessary and sufficient conditions for a state to grow and to develop and, and to mature. What happened as a result of the agricultural revolution is the, is the human species became more sedentary right as we became more sedentary we had well we had to do that so we could grow our crops crops take time to grow you have to tend to them you have to till the soil you have to to potentially manage and maintain animals so you're doing animal husbandry as well and all that requires people to stay in a singular spot so james made the case James C. Scott made the case that because we were focused on specifically growing different kinds of cereal grains, the result was these barbarian warlords, these warlord, warlord tribes emerged to effectively use brute force to force the farmers to give them free grains, to expropriate them, steal from them in various ways. And through the process, of this constant thievery, a state developed basically a legal protection racket. That's what the state is today. It's a it, the idea behind laws and legalization 
it's just a protection racket. Say, hey, we're going to hurt you to, pr to take care of you. We'll protect you from this and this and this so long as you follow our rules. It's basically the idea that if you don't obey the state, the state's going to be the one to hurt you. So it's really the er an early formation of the mafia. The mafia then transforms into the state. So James makes this case, James C. Scott makes this case extremely eloquently, and the book is full of evidence and facts, especially pointing to some of the early farming and agricultural records in Mesopotamia, where the first cities, some of the earliest cities formed, including uh, Babylon, Uruk, a number of different cities. And in the, the, that area during the time was a, more of a kind of a swampy marshland was full of different a variety of different plants it was the climate wasn't nearly as dry and this was a perfect environment for farming to to emerge in different contexts but an interesting thing that James C Scott claims is that as the farms emerged and people became more sedentary sedentism took over populations grew because states began corralling and herding people to these populations because they could increase their wealth. Matter, matter of a fact, wealth amplified, right? wealth intensified within this thugocracy, within this thug class of the states. So these were some of the first more wealthier individuals. Now I think we've, we've made the case. I'm doing a bit of a hand waviness over all of the facts that James C. Scott brings up in his book Against the Grain, and I recommend you read it to get all of the details and the minutia. But what, I wanted, what I'm interested in doing here for the sake of understanding the state at an even deeper level, a more psychological level, is that we look at the, the precursors to the agricultural revolution and to the, the nomadic environment. So by no stretch of the, the imagination was the prehistorical hunter-gatherer environment perfect. There was certainly a variety of different types of violence. But one of the peculiar instances of violence that seems to be somewhat wide, widespread is the harm done toward children. Uh, another really fascinating book that you should read, and this one's way more controversial, it's called The Emotional Life of Nations by Lloyd de Mouse. And de Mouse is, he calls himself a psychohistorian. He's one of the first people to start a school of thought that gives the why of history. Rather than brushing over history with different kind of great men theories and deterministic causation and all of these different kind of sort of non-salient myths behind why history became what it became, very specifically, Lloyd de Mouse says that all nations and governments evolved out of the torment, the damnation, and the abuse of children. He makes the claim in his book that through mass infanticide and mass neglect and abandonment of children, even arbitrary murder of children at various ages as they begin to grow by a lot of times tribal men who just don't like children, that he makes the claim that this was very common. Now I will add an aside here. There have been a lot of people call attention to the quality of scholarship that de Mouse has used in his, his books. And there's a lot of people who are very upset about what he had to say. I think that there's, you know, we certainly should call into question some shoddy scholarship but even in the best case scenario, uh, let's just say that he's completely wrong about all the infanticide, we can very quickly surmise through modern evidence that children are not treated well, right? Spanking is still a perfectly acceptable form of punishment. Hitting children is still perfectly fine. There's even evidence in some, I mean, clearly with boys, circumcision, which is just a form of child genital mutilation, is perfectly acceptable. So we see the evidence, even in today's world, that certain harms toward children are certainly fine. And there's even some far-flung tribal communities that practice infanticide to varying degrees. So without getting into all of the, the minutiae details of, this, of de Mouse's scholarship, we can at least say that children aren't treated well, and it's likely that in prehistoric times that they were treated a lot 
more brutish than they were now. They don't even, children don't even really have full rights. Okay, so let me stop for just a minute. Oh, children, what does that have to do with, with government and the development of the nation state? So DeMaus makes the case that the nation state and whole societies are broken and that one of the primary reasons we go to war, we're okay with becoming sacrificial animals, we kill and we die, and we're so easily entrained by mass formation, is because of all the trauma, all the suffering that we endured as children, governments are just a reflection of that. Some of the evidence, and not just DeMouse points this out, you can also read Alice Miller's book, For Your Own Good. She does a deep case study and analysis of Nazi Germany and totalitarianism. Uh, Hannah Arendt, in her famous treatise on totalitarianism, you know, some of this stuff is, is alluded to. But the idea is clear that governments are reflective of our mental torture as adults and as children, and it's a reflection of that. You can see the paternal references in the, in the nation state and in governments, right? The fatherland, the motherland, Uncle Sam. There's this big brother. There's this idea that governments and the state is somehow a parental figure watching over us. So the idea that we have to sacrifice ourselves to this particular system, to governments, is part of the psychology of the nation state. So we can see here that these warlords under James C. Scott's theory, under his thesis that warlords effectively took over society because we became more sedentary. And we can, if we take DeMaus's theory seriously, we can assume that people were already violent and that violence was exacerbated because of the way that children were being treated. Right. However that developed is another topic entirely, but we can see clearly here how government's emotionality or the lack of emotion manifests in, in governments and why they can treat citizenry the way that, that they do and why we have to figure out a way as individuals looking to exit these systems. We're looking for a way to create a better civilizational narrative around the idea that we're trying to maintain our human connections, our deep humanity, and our emotional content. We see now clearly why the 21st century heralded one of the most destructive centuries in, in humankind with the rise of Nazism, totalitarianism, monological management over society, super controls, and political expediency. I mean, we can see the lack of emotion very clearly in governments that is echoed, you know, with that echo from childhood. I mentioned Hannah Arendt earlier. She went to Adolf Eichmann, who was a, a, a not, notorious Nazi, who he effectively tried to man or he managed deportation of the Jews, and he oversaw a lot of those activities, and he was just blasé to the whole thing. He didn't even really have emotional reactions. And according to Arendt, he just seemed like a normal, everyday guy. And that was what she referred to as the banality of evil. But if you get entrained you know, through mass formation and through various kinds of propagandistic hypnosis with the state, you're willing to just follow orders and not question anything at all. It becomes a psychological loop. And you may even believe, and a lot of Nazis went to their grave believing that they didn't do anything wrong, that they were just following orders. Some of them were in complete denial of everything that happened in general. And if we don't recognize the need for more humanity, the better treatment of children, uh, better connection and more attunement with our emotions and our connections with other humans as we create our new, as we exit government and create our new societies, then we are putting ourselves in a perilous spot. We're putting ourselves in a predicament that could lead to this recursive scenario or this vicious cycle of creating more of the thing that we seek to, to destroy. And again, this is why revolution, bloody revolutions occur because people think that they can replace governments and 
with something with a government governmental system or a, a new nation that actually cares about the people is more democratized or democratic in nature but those systems actually just repeat the sins of the past and it's all because very few people have focused on the psychology of why governance and government why these systems of management degrade into what they and to what they do i mean it's obvious an obvious first step is we don't need to institute violence into our systems. That's a real strong first step. But we also need to teach people that governance without emotion is a governance system that is susceptible to devolving into the things that we seek to to push out, right? Or that we seek to get away from, which is the violence of government, authoritarian control, totalitarianism, etc. So I have a lot more to say about this topic. We're going to get into what I refer to as relational governance in the in the next series. And relational governance is a solution to this problem of of government unemotionality or the problem of cold bureaucracy. How can we implement a rule set over a society or with a society, which is better said? without instituting violence, without instituting all of that emotional baggage that we have as human beings, because our institutions are always a direct reflection of our deep psychology, of our deep humanness, and where we came from. Be it historical, be it genetic, be it evolutionary, be it parental. It's all important, it's all valid, and we'll, we'll get into relational governance and how we can implement relational governance, whether we're building an, an anarchist community or enclave that's going to have no rules, or whether we have an opt-in governance model via some network state. We can discuss and get into all that, but these are a vital, these ideas are of vital importance and we have to take them really seriously. Not enough people are talking about the emotional elements, the psychological elements that make up governance systems and that make up human institutions. All right, guys, really appreciate it. Check out the work of James C. Scott. Check out Lloyd DeMouse. You can actually find Lloyd DeMouse's work online for free if you go to psychohistory.com. He, he's written a lot about what he calls the psychogenic theory of history. And I, I think his work is amazing. It's super underrated. And yes, it's highly controversial. Some things are thrown into question, but I really recommend uh, getting in there and reading it, especially the emotional life of nations. All right, guys. Until next time, take care.